Uh, we're in the midst of a series called Following Jesus. And you might have noticed when I came up, it said following into evangelism. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. I want to start with a word association, though. I'm going to give you a character. I want you to kind of picture that character in your mind and see what we come up with. All right? First one is a college professor. What do you picture? What comes to mind? What about the first president of the United States? Hopefully we all got that one correct. Used car salesman. My apologies to any used car salesman in the audience. What about a librarian? Some might have been picturing a bun, but we got the shush. What about a hippie? Probably could have found a few of your pictures from the 60s, early 70s. Kind of looks like T.A., doesn't it? With long hair? Yeah. An evangelist. What do you picture when you think of an evangelist? Something like this? Or maybe something like this? How many of you pictured yourself when I said to picture an evangelist? When you hear the word evangelism or evangelist, what emotions start to rise up inside of you? I think I probably can divide the audience in three ways. There's a group of people that when I say evangelist or evangelism have no idea what that means. Uh, it's kind of one of those churchy words that you hear, but you're not really sure what it means. There's another group of people that when I mention evangelism or evangelist, you're like, awesome. A message on evangelism, I love it. And then there's probably a large group of people that the emotion within you and the thoughts within you are kind of negative. Maybe it takes you back to a time of knocking on strangers' doors, handing out booklets to strangers, interacting with people and being rejected, feeling pressure from preachers, churches to go out and sort of get a notch in your belt, to coerce people to praying prayers, and that's what you think of when you think about evangelism. I thought about going with a different title because I thought maybe I could find something that's a little bit easier, like following into sharing our faith. Following into loving people. But I wanted to go with that title because I wanted to create anxiety within you. I think just saying that word evangelism might do that. And for some you're saying, all right, that's something for Billy Graham. That's something for Brad. That's something for a few highly gifted, outgoing people. But that's not for me. And so I'm going to kind of check out for about 30 minutes. Well, I hope that I can leave that anxiety today and to talk about evangelism in a way that you can understand that's very practical, and it will be very, very helpful for you. First, let me define evangelism. We threw the word out. What does it mean? Let me use an illustration that I think will help you a lot in understanding this. We live in a city that's very friendly to homeless people. Uh, chances are almost any intersection you go to, you're confronted by someone with a, a cardboard sign. And on it, it probably says something about being hungry. So we encounter people like that. We see them. Well, let's imagine the intersection that you normally go to. There's a person there who has a sign and is asking for help. Well, it's early morning, and he says, you know what? There's a restaurant across the street. I'm going to go over to that restaurant and kind of just see what happens. He walks into the door of the restaurant. They see him. They recognize him as the guy on the corner. They know he's a homeless person. And they say, this is amazing that you came in today. This morning, we just instituted a new policy. And for every homeless person in Austin, we will give them breakfast, lunch, and dinner for free. So the homeless person says, this is amazing. You have met my greatest need. So that first day he experiences breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And his life has changed. Now, wouldn't it be a reasonable expectation and wouldn't it be normal that he would probably go back to the corner that he usually is at. And if there are other homeless people there that he kind of works in conjunction with, he would tell them that. He would say, you're not going to believe it, but you see that restaurant across the street? If you go over there and if you're homeless, they will give you breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And he shares that good, amazing news with them. Don't you think it would also be reasonable that he probably would find some other homeless friends that he had encountered over the years? And he would go to their location and he would say, you need to come to this place because they will give you breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And he's sharing to them this amazing news of what happened in his life. That's a great picture of evangelism. 
Evangelism is simply telling good news. For those of us that know Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, for those of us that have had our, our lives changed now and for eternity, what it means for us is telling other people the good news that happened to us, that Jesus Christ has changed our life. That's evangelism. It's not probably all the things that you have in your mind when you throw the word out there. It hopefully doesn't contain all those negative images that you have. And hopefully you can see, hmm, that might be for me. That might not only be for Billy Graham and his crusade or Brad on a Sunday morning. That might be something for me. It's a reasonable response. Why should we share our faith? At Austin Ridge Bible Church, we have a purpose statement. Our purpose statement says this, that we exist as a church to help people love God and love people. That's why we have a desire for other people to know Christ. So that they could love God and that they could love people as we have experienced. Well, chances are you're reluctant about it. Maybe you're a little gun shy about sharing your faith. I think there's a few reasons for that as well. First reason might be because you've not experienced Jesus Christ. Before the age of 19, I never thought about sharing my faith in Christ with anybody. Because I didn't have a relationship with Christ. So it never crossed my mind. And so maybe you've not come to that point yet where you have a relationship with Christ. Where you know him as your Lord and Savior. So you don't think about telling other people. That's a normal response. Others are reluctant because you don't know what to say. Within you there's this desire to share your faith. Within you there's kind of this burning passion. But you're going, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to start the conversation. I'm afraid to start it because they might ask a question that I don't know how to answer. And so you don't know what to say. And you think, I could use some more training. Well, in October and November, we're going to give some more training. So be looking for that. We're going to help you to know how to share your faith in a very natural way. Uh, for others, you're reluctant to share your faith because of fear of rejection. I think this might be the number one reason we don't share. Because we're afraid if we kind of put ourselves out there, if we let people know that we have faith in Christ, they may think we're a Jesus freak. They may turn from us. We might lose a friendship. We might lose a family member. And, and we're afraid to do that. We're afraid to put ourselves out there. Again, that's a normal emotion. If you feel that way, that's okay. That's normal. Because there's risk involved with that. I need you to take your expressions for just a minute and turn to the back side. And hopefully you have a pen or a pencil. And hopefully you have an expression. If not, you can just follow along with me in your mind. All right, so grab your expressions. Take a look at it. Uh, we need to be interactive. Uh, Brad often says we don't just want our faith to be a Sunday thing. We want it to be an everyday thing. And so as I go through the message I'm going to go through, uh, I think there's practical ways you can follow along with me and practical applications. First thing I need for you to do is up top you'll notice a prayer list. And it has three slots there. I want you to take a minute. And I want you to think of either a family member, a work colleague, or a friend who does not have a personal relationship with Christ. So take a minute and think of that. Who are those people that you know that you encounter who don't have a relationship with Christ? I'm going to give you just about a, a 30 seconds or so to think of who they are and write them down. Write them down. Or get them in your mind. I really want you to have those three names in your mind. A friend, maybe a coworker, or a family member. Who doesn't have a relationship with Christ? Anxiety building? Who are those three people? Now, I want you to either look at them or think of them and ask this question. What do I do? <laughs> what do I do? I have this feeling inside of me that I want my friends, family, coworkers to know Christ like I know them. But what do I do? That's my goal today is to help you to know what to do. To help you to, with a practical, simple way of how you can introduce your friends to the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk about something called spiritual CPR. We understand CPR. When someone is in dire straits, we might administer CPR to them in order to save their lives. I want to talk about spiritual CPR. It means cultivate, plant, and reap. It's something that you can remember it's something that I think is practical. I think it's something that's doable. It's not super scary. And hopefully that uh, you will understand more about it today. We're going to look at John chapter 4. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to it. What we're going to do is look at an experience in the life of Jesus. And how I believe he used spiritual CPR. In the life of this woman in John chapter 4. 
I'm not going to be able to depth all of the truths from John chapter 4. There's a ton of things in here. And you could probably do several messages on it. But what I want to do is look at how Jesus used CPR and use it as a springboard to help you with your friends and family members. All right, spiritual CPR. The C stands for cultivating. A farmer has a desire to, to reap a harvest, to bring in a crop. What's the first step that he does? He breaks up the ground. He breaks up the hard ground. He cultivates. Let's look at chapter 4, starting at verse 3. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. So far, pretty uneventful. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus is with his 11 followers before he's ready to ascend into heaven. And he says that I'm going to all the world and make disciples. That's kind of the command that he gave to them. It's also the command for us to go and help other people know Jesus Christ. In that verse it says go. The word go is better translated as you are going. In other words, in the course of life. And we say a great example here in the course of Jesus' life. He had had an experience where he was teaching and preaching, and now he's leaving that experience. He's going on a journey, and he's traveling through Samaria. Again, very unventful, very ordinary. He's tired because of the long journey, and he sits down by a well because he wants a drink. Sharing our faith needs to happen in the course of life as we are going. One of the fears that you had, perhaps when I threw out that word evangelism, was perhaps in your background, evangelism was seen as something that was organized by a group of people and you were sent out to this group of strangers or you're sent to a mall or you're sent to a park and that's what you envision when you think about evangelism. The first thing to realize, evangelism is about as we are going in the ordinary course of our lives. It's around noon and Jesus is thirsty. Let's read on a little bit more. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? He was alone, and his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. In understanding the story, it's important to realize that the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. They wouldn't talk. They wouldn't drink. They wouldn't eat. They wouldn't associate. In fact, when they were traveling this journey, oftentimes they would travel a long distance around in order to avoid Samaritans. So this woman is surprised that Jesus is speaking to her. Surprised that Jesus is asking for a drink from her. When I thought about this verse a little bit more, I asked myself, is there anybody in my life, anybody in my world that's surprised that I'm their friend? Is there anybody that looks at our friendship and says, I don't get this. Dave's a pastor and he's my friend. Is there anybody surprised? Is there anybody surprised by your friendship? Or do we only associate and gather around those people that are just like us? Maybe we only associate with people that are Christians. We don't even associate with people that don't have faith in Christ. Is there anybody in your life, is there anybody in my life that's surprised by my friendship with them. Surprised that I'm talking to them. We see that here. We see that this woman is surprised because Jesus is speaking with her. Let me talk about cultivating and what it is. Let me give you a definition. Cultivating is using common life experiences to build bridges with people that don't have faith in Jesus Christ. That's what cultivating is. So the first part of CPR is building bridges or cultivating relationships with people that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what cultivating means. It means breaking up the hard ground, building a bridge. How did Jesus start this conversation? He didn't start it off with saying, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you'd spend eternity? Freaking the woman out and her running away. He said, can I have a drink of water, please? A very, very common thing. Let me tell you how you can begin cultivating. So we have our three friends. 
We have people that we're thinking about. Remember I said, what do you do? Let me give you four things you can do in cultivating. Number one, pray. The most important thing you can do. We have people in our life that we want to we want to influence, we want to share our faith with, and yet we don't pray. An important thing to realize about CPR or evangelism is that you can't do it. So if you're thinking, I can't do this, you are right. If you're thinking, I can't convince anybody to follow Jesus, you are correct. It is something that you cannot do, and we need to pray. The only person that can break up a hard ground, the only person that can influence a person that, of their need for Christ is God himself. So we have to believe as we enter into this process that God is at work. That God has placed these people into your lives because he wants to work into your life. I truly believe that God is working in people's lives all the time. And I kind of envision it as if him having people by the collar. And he's working in their life and he has them by the collar because he needs to lead them to somebody. Because he's given us the responsibility of sharing. And so he wants to lead them to you. And he wants you to be able to be involved in our life. So we need to pray. Number two, we need to spend time with spiritually disconnected people. Are you spending time with people that don't know Christ? Or do you only spend time with Christians? That's not God's design for us. That's not his desire. When he said to his followers, go into all the world, his intent wasn't that we would hang out with Christians and Christ followers all the time. That wasn't his intent. That wasn't his desire. Same thing for our kids. I love that my kids had opportunity to hang out with people that didn't know Jesus Christ so they could learn how to interact with them. Spending time with spiritually disconnected people. Why do you live where you live? Is it because it's the house you wanted? Why do you work where you work? Is it because you were amazing in that interview and you landed the job? Or is it possible that God has placed us in those places so that as we are going... We could be spending time with people that are lost. So one of the things in cultivating is just kind of to turn our thinking around and that we're more intentional. We go, ah, oh, maybe that's why I work where I work. Maybe that's why my kid is in that sport. Maybe that's why I run, why I bike. So that I can then be around people that are spiritually disconnected. So one of the ways to spend time with people is not maybe even to change your lifestyle, but to be more intentional with your lifestyle. Do you work out? Do you run? Do you bike? Maybe you need to find some people. Maybe to join a running club, a biking club, so that you can be around people that are spiritually disconnected. What about your kids' sports and activities? For Karen and I, that was one of the great opportunities we had. As, my, as our kids played sports uh, throughout the years, we had opportunity to build bridges with people that were spiritually disconnected from God. And so I began to look at the people around and say, well, instead of just looking at them as people that I'm involved with, why don't I look at them as people that, that need Christ? And I started praying for them. I started interacting with them. What are the things that you ordinarily do that you can begin to think differently about? Maybe you go hunting. Maybe you go fishing. Maybe you're a golfer. And you need to think about the guys you golf with. And maybe up to this point, you've been thinking of them as guys you golf with. And now you need to think of, okay, maybe God has placed me with this group of guys so that I can begin to break up the ground. I can begin to cultivate. All right, so we pray. We spend time. The third thing we do in cultivating is live it. You've got to live it. They need to look at you and they need to say, there's something different about that person. That's the best boss I've ever had. That's the best employee I've ever had. That's the best friend I've ever had. Are there any spiritually disconnected people that would look to you and say, that's an amazing friend to me. That's a genuine person. We need to listen to them. We need to love them. We need to serve them. We need to be involved in their lives. And that takes work. And that takes time. One of the things I struggle with in building bridges to spiritually disconnected people is time. I'm a person that's always thinking about the next thing I have to do. And I don't linger with people. That's just one of the challenges that I have. I'm always kind of rushing on to the next thing. And God says you need to linger, Dave. You need to be patient. You need to listen. You need to love. You need to spend time with spiritually disconnected people if we're going to build bridges to them. I am new to Austin, so I don't have any friends yet. And the friends I have are kind of all around here. I need to be looking for ways to build bridges to spiritually lost people. And I need to be a genuine friend to them. That was the fourth thing. The third thing was live it. The fourth thing was be a genuine friend. Be a real friend. 
Don't bail on them. Jesus didn't bail on us. Be a genuine friend. How do you cultivate? You pray. You live it. You spend time. And you're a genuine friend. All right, here's a challenge for you. I'm going to give you some challenges this morning. Uh, some takeaway. Challenge number one. How can you be more intentional in this area? How can you be more intentional in building bridges to spiritually disconnected people? If you got it now, you can write it down now. That's fine. Or you can think about it. Take an expression and work on this. If we get good at cultivating, our church will change. Every step you move in a process from cultivating to planting to reaping involves more risk. Cultivating, we can get really good at. And if we begin building bridges, if we begin loving and listening and caring and being a genuine friend and praying, we will be amazed at the things that God will do at Austin Ridge. You'll be amazed at how we bring people by the collar into your life. You'll be amazed that as you start to do this, you find out what's happening in people's lives and you had no idea. As you begin to care for them and listen to them and you hear their story, you'll be amazed. Wow, this is why this person's in my life. And God wants me to build a bridge to them so that they might come to faith in Christ. All right, the P of CPR is planting. Cultivating meant build bridges. The P of CPR means planting. What does planting mean? Just as it's reasonable for the farmer after, after he's cultivated uh, the ground, he needs to plant seed. P means planting. It means introducing Jesus into the friendship. Planting Jesus into the friendship. Introducing Jesus into the friendship. We've cultivated. We've broken up the ground. We've built trust. We've loved them. We've served them. And now we need to prayerfully look for opportunities to introduce Jesus into that friendship. It wouldn't be reasonable for the farmer to stop at cultivating and go, all right, I'm done. We would expect he would plant. Same thing in spiritual CPR. We need to be prayerfully looking for opportunities to introduce Jesus into that friendship. Let's see how Jesus did it. <clears throat> she asked him, how, do you, how are you asking me for a drink? Verse 10. Jesus answered him, if you answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself? As did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming to draw water. Well, Jesus cleverly starts to use water, their common need. He came to the well because he was thirsty. She came to the well because she was coming to draw water. And Jesus, in a very clever way, begins to have this conversation to her about water. Now, we have to find the ways that work for us. Okay, as we begin to introduce people. What are the ways that work for us as we talk? And I'll give you some ideas, all right. But Jesus here uses this illustration of water. And he says, everybody who drinks this water will remain thirsty. Think about your three friends. Think about the friends you know. What are they drinking? What are they drinking in their life? What is it that they are drinking that's trying to satisfy them? What is the thing that they think is what they need? In this life? Is it fitness? Is it success? Is it their image? Is it their kids? Is it their career? Is it money, power, relationships? What are your friends drinking? And do you really truly believe that that won't satisfy? Maybe it's religion. It doesn't satisfy either. What are our friends drinking from? What about this woman? Water is a wonderful illustration of need in our life. And that's what Jesus does here. Jesus uses water to cleverly speak to us, to her. And then see how he goes on from here. Verse 16. Go call your husband and come. Why in the world did Jesus say that? <laughs> what a bizarre thing to say to her. He said it because he knew what she was trying to drink from. He knew what in her life she was trying to get to satisfy her. 
she says this in verse 17, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Now, the difference between Jesus and us, as we're trying to plan, is Jesus was God. And he kind of knew a lot of things, all right. So, don't, the best method might not be to go to work tomorrow and wait by the water fountain. <laughs> Just waiting for somebody to come up that's had five husbands. And say, thirsty? <laughs> Let me tell you about living water. But Jesus can do this. And we need to find ways that we can introduce Jesus. And I'll, I'll help you with that in a minute. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. I love that line. Sir, I, I, I wish I could say it the way she said it. Sir, I can see you're a prophet. Because you just told me I have five husbands. And the person I'm living with is not my husband. And look where she goes. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So now she realizes he, he knows who I am. He knows why I'm here at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And not here in the morning with all the other women in the village. Because the religious people don't like me. And they don't like hanging out with me. And now you understand a little bit more why she was surprised that Jesus was speaking to her. More surprised than she even realized. So here's a person now she recognizes as a prophet who's Jewish, who's speaking to her, who's building friendship with her, who's building, breaking down bridge, bridges with her, and who knows her. And it freaks her out. So she begins a religious conversation. Because that's what she thinks she needs. Right? This person sees inside of me. He's a prophet. Let's start talking about religion because, man, I've really messed my life up. I've had five husbands. And my life is really messed up. Let's talk about religion because that's probably what I need. What does Jesus do? Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. That just meant that the promises of God, the, the Bible all pointed toward a Messiah who was Jewish. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers Father seeks. The Father speaks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. Where are your friends going to go as you begin talking about faith? Right here. They're going to start talking about religion. Yeah, I, I, I go to church. Yeah, I, I was baptized. I, I live a good life. Don't go there. Because we're not presenting religion to people. And that's not what Jesus was presenting either. What he's saying to them, it's not how you worship. It's who you worship. And all we're trying to do is to let people know, hey, my life's got challenges. But Jesus Christ has entered in my life. And he's done amazing things in my life. So she wants to talk religion. Jesus isn't going there. And what Jesus does is he introduces himself Let's read on just a little bit longer. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Now Jesus goes to a place that only he can go, that we can't go. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. That's planting. What Jesus did with this woman was he built a friendship with her. He spoke to her, which wasn't even going to happen back then with Jews and Samaritans. He talked to her. He even revealed to her that she'd had five husbands. And somehow he did that in a non-judgmental way and in a loving way. And then he planted or he introduced himself into this relationship. And he said, I'm the Messiah. How do we plant? What do we do? I'm going to give you a few ideas. So you've been cultivating. You've been breaking up the ground between you and your friend, family member, work colleague, whatever. And you've been living it. You've been praying it. Now comes at a point where you want them to know that you have faith. What do you do? Let me help you out with that a little bit. You can share value statements. What I mean by a value statement is by saying things like, oh, I'll pray for that. And they go, oh, okay. That person must have faith. Saying things like, oh, my kids went to this great event at church. As you're talking about something and maybe something that happened in your life, you're saying, you know, my faith really helped me through that. You're not bowling them over. You're not pulling out your Bible at this point. You're just talking to them about what's important in my life. So now they're putting some things together. So this person that's really my friend, this person that loves me in an amazing way, is now 
introducing faith, in, and it's making sense, going, you know what, I knew there was something different about that person. Number two, you can take advantage of the things we offer here at Austin Ridge. There are events that men do, bobbed around sports, maybe a speaker who was uh, in the military. There are things that women do. There are events that we offer here, and the reason we offer them is to help you in this process, to introduce friends. Uh, some of the things our student ministry does, wakeboard camp, retreats, is meant to help in this process so that then they can hear about Christ. You can invite someone to church. Christmas Eve is a great time. Easter. So the person you're building bridges to, the person you're living it in front of, why don't you say to them, hey, why don't you come to church with us on Christmas Eve? I serve is a great one. So I've been building this friendship with somebody. They know that I'm kind of involved in church. And I say, you know what, our church isn't meeting on May 25th, whatever the date might be. Would you be interested in coming and serving with us and bringing them along? And they get to see the church in action. That's a great way to plan. That's a great way to introduce faith in. Another thing is questions. Throwing a lot of stuff at you guys this morning. This is really a four-part series that we'll go over in training. So I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but my hope is that this is motivating you. And you're saying, you know what, I, I need to get involved in this. I need to start cultivating. I need to start planting. All right, you can ask questions. Uh, what's your faith background? I used this one this past week. What kind of church did you grow up in? And just start talking, listening. Learning about them. Who do you think Jesus Christ is? Where are you at on your spiritual journey? Does God seem distant or close to you? What do you find hard to believe about God? Don't be afraid of these questions. And don't be afraid to go, yeah, I don't know the answer to that one either. It really freaks me out that God has always existed. So if somebody goes to me, I, I find it hard to believe that God has always existed. You know what I'm going to say? Yeah, me too. That takes a lot of faith. And I'll talk about kind of my challenges with that. that, that that's hard for me. When I think about God always existing, that's tough. It's okay. We're just getting spiritual dialogue with people. We're just being natural. We're just being real with them. And we're letting them know that faith is a part of our lives. And we can do that by asking questions. For some of us, we can ask the, some penetrating questions because we've earned the right to do that in our friends. Number four, tell your story. Everyone who knows Christ needs to know how to tell your story. I know how to tell my story in 30 seconds, 3 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever kind of fits. I'm able to say, you know, there was a point in my life where I didn't have a relationship with Christ. And here's what my life was like. And then I came to know Christ, my Savior. Here's how that happened. And then here's what my life is like later. That's what telling your story is. My life before Jesus, how I came to know Jesus, and how Jesus changed my life. That's what it means to tell your story. And in our class that we'll offer, we'll help you to do that. And there will be other opportunities as well down the road. Challenge number two. Is there someone you need to take this step with? Is there somebody that you've been cultivating with, you've been building the bridges with, but as you look at that relationship, you say, you know what, I need to introduce Jesus into this friendship. I need to find a way to let them know that faith is a part of my life. How are you going to do it? How, what's your plan? That's challenge number two. The R of CPR means reap. Reap a harvest. So you can see the kind of farmer illustration. The farmer cultivates the land and breaks it up. He plants seed and then he reaps a harvest. Does he do anything to have that harvest come about? No. Other than cultivating and reaping, which he can do. But the fact that a harvest arrives is, is really a miracle. So as we're cultivating friendships, as we're building bridges, as we're introducing our faith into that friendship, only God can reap a harvest. Only God can bring a person to a point where they say, you know what, I think I need that. I hope that you're still amazed by the fact that you're a, a Christ follower. I hope you're still amazed by the fact that how did this happen? It was, it was God. I can look back and I can see people that came into my life. I can see events. And I can say, no person did that. Only God did it. So as we cultivate, as we introduce Jesus in our friendship, we need to prayerfully look for opportunities to ask our friends, hey, have you ever considered asking Christ into your life? What's holding you back from this step? Remember I said every step takes a little more risk? It does. Every step takes a little more training also. And you need to look for opportunities for training. As God moves in people's lives, and as the timing is right, we need to look for those opportunities. 
Challenge number three is, do you have anybody in your life that you need to ask that question to? That maybe you've been doing these steps, and you need to tell your story and say, has anything like that ever happened to you? This is what Christ has called us to. This is what is normal and reasonable. It's normal and reasonable that we would tell other people about breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Isn't it normal and reasonable that that would happen? Is it challenging? Is it a little daunting? Sure. It is. But it's normal and it's reasonable. And that's challenge number three. I'm going to give you a bonus challenge this morning. Challenge number four. August 21st, as you saw, we're opening up a new building, Building D. And our hope and desire is that we're filling that with people that you're cultivating with and that you're planting Jesus into those friendships. We're really not interested in filling it with people from other churches. That happens, but that's not our desire. Our desire is that we would help people who are spiritually disconnected come to love God and love people. That's what we want as a church. So our hope is that you will be intentional about cultivating, planting, and that we might fill this campus up with people that are interested in Jesus Christ. That's what our desire is. That's what we want to see happen. Because that's what we think Christ has called us to as a church. So here's your bonus challenge number four. When I first moved to uh, Austin, I began going around and doing stuff. I'm signing up for this service. I'm getting cable. I'm getting a washer, a dryer. We're doing all this stuff. You know, I'm signing up. I'm going to DMV. I'm doing all these things. And as I began talking with people, I found myself saying, man, I wish I just had something I could give to somebody. Uh, I'm at the driving range over at Falconhead one day and uh, was out hitting some balls. And a guy kind of walks up with a Phillies hat and a, a Phillies shirt and an Eagles hat on. So I kind of thought, I think that guy's from Philadelphia. Uh, I grew up in southern New Jersey, which is kind of a suburb of Philadelphia. So all the Philadelphia teams are my favorite teams. And so it was kind of a natural thing to go, hey, uh, you must be from Philadelphia. <laughs> and so we begin talking about stuff. We talk about how there's no good cheesesteaks in Austin. And we talk about the pizza being slightly above average. And we begin talking about stuff. And one of the things as we were kind of wrapping up, I said, hey, do you have a church? It, it was a normal thing to say, you know, because he asked what I do, you know, and all that stuff. And I really wish at that point I could have pulled a card out and said, hey, I love my church, and just check it out. So what we have done is we've made some cards like that, and I'm going to need your help. Here's challenge number four. We want you to take a card and to give it to two people. Two people, all right. It might be somebody you know. It might be a waitress. Uh, there's been times where I've had... Uh, Eating out, and I would love to say to a waitress or a waiter, hey, I love my church. Why don't you check it out? And why don't you come see it? So that's challenge number four. And we can all do that, can't we? If we love God, if we love people, we love this place, we can say to somebody, hey, I'd love for you to, to come out. We want you to do spiritual CPR with people. We want you to build relationships with your friends. We want you to introduce Christ into that friendship. And we want, us, and we want us, you to see God work in their lives and see them come to faith. So here's how I need help. In, in, in your seats... There's a little um, pouch. And so those of you that have a pouch, can you grab the cards out of there and make sure the people around you have two cards? Can you do that? So we'll need some help. Uh, if, there, if you don't have any, can you ask the people behind you? Don't be shy. Cultivate, cultivate with the people around you. Don't be shy. Ask for a card. You know, hey, if you're checking this stuff out, <laughs> it's okay. You don't, you don't need to take a card. All right. But can you make sure the people around you kind of get two cards? So that's challenge number four. Put it in your wallet, put it in your purse, and pray. Say, God, give me an opportunity to give this to two people. It's a baby step we're trying to help you with. It's a little bit of a risk. It's a reasonable risk. My hope today in this message was that I would create some anxiety in the beginning about evangelism. And then my hope was that you would see through spiritual CPR... It's a, it's a natural, as you are going, thing that we can be involved with. We don't need to say, evangelism is, for, is not for me. My hope is that you say, you know what? I think I can be involved in this CPR stuff. You can at least cultivate, right? Just take that step. Just start building bridges to spiritually disconnected people. Uh, can you stand? And I'll pray for us. Father God, within us, uh, be
because of knowing your son, there's a desire to see other people know him. And when we think about this topic, it brings all kinds of emotions and thoughts. Maybe some of us have kind of checked it off and said, no, this is not something for me. I don't want to be involved in this. But maybe, Lord, as they listen to this message, they realize that it's, that's reasonable and it's normal that we would tell people about breakfast, lunch, and dinner and, and the difference you've made in our lives. So, Lord, we want to do it. As we think about these friends that we thought of or wrote down, Lord, our prayer is that you would work in their lives. Lord, not so that they can have religion, not so they can come to church, but so they might in, encounter your son and have their life changed now and forever. So, Father, open up doors. Open up hearts. Help us be genuine friends. Help us to live it. God, we're excited as we take this step to see all the things you'll do. And we will hear amazing stories of life change because of taking this step. Lord, give us an opportunity to give this card to two people. And help us to be amazed again as we encounter people and talk to people and say, wow, this is the perfect, perfect opportunity to give this card to somebody. Lord, thanks for your presence here this morning. We're grateful as we go out to do this that your presence and your power will be with us. And Lord, help us to depend upon you in it. Thanks for an opportunity to worship you in spirit and truth this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks. We'll see you next week.